All right, Ty, we're almost there. And for those of you who are trying to listen through this in one sitting, I, oh, you know. Oh, good, good on please you. Please <laughs> take a break. <laughs> and if you're but, driving, I hope yeah, you've pulled yeah, over a few times yeah. to the side. Anyway, the last of the dirty dozen, uh, although I like this article this is a quite good article. a bit. It's by Manthus et al. It's called Avoiding Circulatory Complications During Endotracheal Intubation and the Initiation of Positive Pressure Ventilation. This is something we do all the time. And Di and I were talking about our respective uh, morbidity and mortality conferences, so-called death and donuts in the academic <laughs> world, and the kinds of things we see. And some of the stuff that's talked about in here is in there. And I, th this paper, I, th I think it's a great choice for it's the LLSA wonderful. because we do we intubate people, and knowing where you're going with this is important. So let's let's jump right in. And we get a little blasé about it. Yeah, no, it's easy so to get complacent. Mm -hmm. So we frequently intubate critically ill patients. We want to minimize the morbidity and mortality. Some of this requires you to know a little bit about vents and the pathology. And there's some really easy ways to circumvent some bad juju here if you recognize it and do it. So part of this is uh, knowing who and why you're intubating. So the pathogenesis of respiratory failure. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is hypoxic uh, respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure. And that comes from any of these things and more atelectasis, pulmonary edema, pulmonary infection, mucus plugging, pulmonary emboli, pulmonary infarction, blast lung, yeah, there you go. goes down the list. Um, and so um, you want to sort of identify those. In hypercapnic respiratory failure, this is when you have the neuromuscular incapacity. In other words, you can't do the work of breathing anymore, whether it's because your muscles are fatigued or you're metabolically unable. Um, you'll get uh, neuromuscular uh, incapacity, and this can occur uh, with an acute stressor in patients with chronic or compensated hypercapnia like COPD. You can see it in obesity when they get sick, um, um, the so-called obesity hypoventilation syndrome. And you can see this a lot of times acute on chronic. You can see it in a variety of other settings as well. Having noted those sort of two purer examples, a lot of times respiratory failure is a combination of hypercaptic respiratory failure and hypoxemic. It may not be pure one or the other. There's a lot of mixed pictures out there. And so you want to pay attention to what it is. And maybe one of them will emerge as more important than the other when you get there. So we're going to talk about that. So what are the indications for an airway intervention? And Ron Walls's fourth edition of uh, emergency airway management, his book just came out, um, you know, that's sort of um, the sort of the Cadillac of talking about this in, in a very sophisticated and detailed way. But I really like what this paper has to say about some of the things about this. And um, so indications for airway intervention, respiratory failure, decreased airway protective reflexes. It's not acceptable to let someone aspirate. Aspiration pneumonia has, you know, bad, bad outcomes, 20% mortality, 30% mortality in some studies. Um, and so, is this patient you're looking at appropriate for a trial of non-invasive ventilation, something we've done a lot more on? That might be particularly true in COPD or in obesity hypoventilation syndrome, CHF right, exacerbations. Should all, be true. You should try it in those. All respond really well to non-invasive. Asthma, less so, but there mm -hmm. are some places that people have tried it. They got to be awake enough to do it, have competent airways and hemodynamically stable, and you got to monitor them and see if they're in training the machine or or, or if they're learning to work with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, how about intubation? Common sense principles: don't wait until the crisis point. You'd be better to take that airway earlier in a more organized way than waiting for it to be a crash. Mm -hmm. Uh, be prepared, um, obviously support staff, equipment, medications, crash cart backup. In this case, the medications in Los Angeles, you might have to actually have pre-ordered some stuff. We've been intermittently at LA County out <laughs> of true. Atomidate and out of succinylcholine, yeah, which means you better know what the alternatives are. Yeah. Um, you want to closely monitor their vital signs, pre-oxygenate as much as possible and as optimally as possible. Use your airway adjuncts and backups. Um, in Ron Walls's recent version and uh, recently on some other things, is, you know, the statement has been made that video laryngoscopy is the way to do this. Way to go. It's the way to go. And so increasingly data is showing superiority for that. And then finally, if they're paralyzed, you've got to be cognizant of their pathophysiologic needs. So, for example, if a patient's got a pH of 7 and they were breathing at 30 because they're in severe DKA and you intubate them and set the vent at 20, they're in trouble. They're in trouble because you just created... You took over. Right. They're, you took over their ventilatory rate. They were breathing at 30 for a reason because they were trying to eliminate their acid load via their lungs, and now you're not doing it. So you can expect their pH to drop and possibly them to crash. 
a favorite topic of Eminem. <laughs> yes, exactly. So the authors here point out that there are common and preventable complications, and they want to focus in on sort of four ways these happen. Insufficient venous return, acid-base failure, which I mm -hmm. just talked about, severe obstructive lung disease, and severe hy hypoxemia. So we're going to go into some detail on all these. So let's talk about insufficient venous return. This has a lot to do with the fact that you're increasing intrathoracic pressures, so if they're fluid behind or, or if they're having problems with venous return, you might make that worse. So about a quarter of all patients who you intubate are gonna develop transient hypotension after emergent intubation. You ought to sort of be aware of that, that number. And when you know they're hypovolemic beforehand or a particular risk for this, maybe you ought to chase them up before you plast the plastic. And so go after them with a little bit of fluids before you do it. There also is another reason why this happens, which is, is that when you finally sedate them and take care of them with their automate or whatever else you're using, fentanyl, they might have a crash in their catechols. Overall, that might be good for them, but it might also cause hypotension, so be prepared for it. So we got the three reasons, catechol drop, hypovolemia, and rising intrathoracic pressure. Some few common senses, things can fix that. If they're hypovolemic, chase them up first. If you're worried about a catechol drop, um, then you can use other agents like ketamine that won't cause that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're worried about intrathoracic pressure rise, then use smaller volumes and pay attention to what your parameters are and what your plateau pressure and your peak inspiratory pressures are so you're not playing that game. So this uh, insufficient venous return, what are the solutions? Instead of bolus sedating, consider local anesthesia. If you're using sedative, use multiple small doses. Change agents, as I said. Begin volume resuscitation in all but the evidently hypervolemic patients. Common sense. Keep a vasoconstrictor like phenylephrine handy. And um, Scott um, um, Weingart. Weingart recently did a little thing on having the, you know, that you ought to have it in your pocket, the little phenylephrine to just chase it back up if you need it. Start your ventilation settings with minimal to no peep and lower tidal volumes like eight per kilo. Then increase tidal volume slowly. Follow your plateau airway pressures. Keep know them under, how to look for those. Keep plateau them under 30. Really and if important. they don't, some vents won't report plateau airway pressures for you, but if they only have pips for you, peak inspiratory pressures, then follow those and keep the pips under 40. Plateau, though, is better than peak inspiratory pressure. If you have your choice between which to look at, look at the plateaus. Um, for ARDS and asthma, initial tidal volume should be even less. And then customize your settings for the patient's physiology and the patient's pathology. So nice common sense stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, acid base failure, we already sort of talked about this. If they're breathing at 30 and you intubate them and put them at a rate of 20, don't be surprised. Their acidosis will worsen and they may crash on you. They get these bradysystolic arrests when you let them- Within, uh, within yeah, moments. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, yeah it doesn't yeah. take long at all. And, and they, don't, they often don't come back. So it's, in some instances, it's kind of a clean kill. So this is particularly a patient with, uh, if they're intubated after seizures, where they just got this new acid load. Or they seize while they're intubated. Or they're seized while they're intubated. I mentioned severe DKA, certain intoxications like methanol, which is notorious for mm -hmm. giving you pHs around seven. You got you to gotta recognize this. So adjust the ventilator settings appropriately for their acidosis and what their pre-intubation ventilation rates would be if they were optimal. And if you want to give some IV bicarb to buy some time, because it will until the lactic acid is metabolized, then by all means do so. So avoid hypotension because that's just creating Makes more acid, acid load. If sedation and paralysis are necessary, choose vent settings that are similar. We talked about that. And if endotracheal intubation is contemplated, complicated by a seizure, then consider bicarb. And one of the other messages that comes through this, and I've said this all the time, I don't know why it is after we intubate someone in the emergency room, we turn into a carnival caller. He's about uh, 65 kilos, and I think he's a Capricorn. We'll give him, and we spout off some settings, which may have nothing to do with anything. And when you ask people what those settings are, you find out that they only have like a repertoire of two settings that they call out <laughs> when they ought to have a repertoire of 10. So if you're going to have sort of whatever this repertoire is and you're going to call them out, then maybe you ought to check an ABG and see where you are, particularly if it's a sick patient where you're not sure. You ought to chase with an ABG to see where you're at. So possible solutions when muscle function and adequate mental status are regained, patients will trigger the vent. And if they're not, then you can do some things to help them trigger the vent, which we'll talk about a little bit later.
Now, if they're stacking and they have obstructive lung disease, either asthma or COPD, those trapped gases go beyond the area of obstruction. Remember that in asthma in particular, the problem is they can't exhale. So hooking them to a machine to help them inhale ain't the solution. You might need to do it, but you're going to need to pay a lot of attention to their exhaling. So be careful of that. And if you don't do that, then their intrathoracic pressures will soar, their pips will get high, their plateaus will get high, they can get hypotension and death. Another visit to death and donuts. So what can you do? If the ventilator is programmed, programmed to stop delivering breath when certain airway pressures are exceeded, then you're going to need to fix this so that it can still ventilate for them. So you're going to have to relieve those pressures. And uh, increasing inspiratory and expiratory ratios, giving a longer expiratory ratio will help. And you can do things like manually exhale them. And there are these recruitment maneuvers, which are going to be mentioned in a moment, that you can do as well. So um, what can you do to, about this? You can do things like permissive hypercapnia by allowing hypoventilation and hypercapnia so you don't stack. And this really helps, particularly in asthmatics. But there are other situations where you'll see it work. In COPD patients, they can have bronchospasm, and when um, bronchospasm improves, they can have problems with atelectasis. So you got to sort of walk the line between there. But again, here you see low volumes, low rates, plateau pressures less than 30, and then when you're worried about atelectasis, you can start going yeah. after so a larger volume. So they start volumes. to get better. That's yeah. when you start to get yeah. the volumes up. Yeah. So patients often have intrinsic PEEP so that they're too weak to overcome to trigger the ventilator. An exogenous PEEP may help the situation, but generally speaking, hold off on PEEP. This routine usage of PEEP has sort of gone mm -hmm. by the boards. So this is a situation where it might work, and it doesn't help in all COPD patients, but it might help, and it can be tried if the patient is not triggering the vent. Now, in ARDS, when they're unable to oxygenate, you can do things um, to help them there, and the ARDSnet study talks about it. So let's look at ARDSnet. Start the tidal volumes really low. When the patient's synchronous with the ventilator, and synchrony is a big part of this, huge. Uh, then you can titrate the tidal volume to maintain the plateau pressure below 30. So now we're hearing not just plateau pressures that we want to watch, but synchrony that we want to watch. You can increase the PEEP as you need to to increase SATs. Just get them to 90, not higher. And as the PEEP increases, the tidal volume may need to be decreased to keep your plateau pressures. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're hearing you're what their recommendation line, are is to focus on data points that you heretofore might not have been focused on. And again, maintaining the synchrony. It's defeated if there's excessive overbreathing. So that means they might need to be um, sedated or whatever it is that you need to do to get there. Now, goal is synchrony. How can you do it? Get the tidal volumes low, peep at five to start. Increase the PEEP three to five every two to three minutes and decrease the tidal volume. Walk the line until you get numbers that you like. If you're unable to achieve that goal, then you can do other maneuvers. You can do go to high-frequency jet ventilation. You can go to proning them. And finally, there's recruitment maneuvers. And a lot of people, when I talk about recruitment maneuvers, they don't know what I'm talking about. And what recruitment maneuvers are a prolonged inhalation, a prolonged exhalation, or a sigh. And sometimes you actually need to do this by disconnecting them to the vent and manually exhaling them, doing a really long one, much longer than your IDE ratio, so that they can then recruit alveolar units that are oxygenated but currently not being used. And that's the goal here. And it's amazing how much of a difference you can make in a, in a patient who you've intubated in the ER who you're having prob problems Especially with asthma. by doing re um, mm -hmm. these recruitment maneuvers. Um, severe hypoxemia, what if the check ratio shows low bar consolidation? Then the effects of PEEP are really not as predictable. And you really don't know why the patient's hypoxic at that point because they got a low bar infiltrate that Shouldn't should that make them hypoxic. Mm -hmm. You now got to start worrying about other things. Do they have a PE? Do they have some other problem? Is there a tox issue? What is it? So our summary. And I love this paper because this is, this is to me, pit doc physiology, what an ER doc needs to be able to do. We need to know lots of ways to skin these cats. Mm -hmm. I love the solutions that were proposed by these authors and, and find them to be very much part of my practice, but I've never seen them as concisely yeah, put nice together in a paper as very they well were done. here. So I really like this a lot. Again, not that they care what I think, but it, I, th I thought this was great.
So this is an intensivist approach. That's the first thing I disagree with in the paper. No, this is an emergency physician's <laughs> approach. This needs to be integrated into our world. Um, specific measures should be considered in patients when you just intubated them. And here's the summaries. Intubate early, be prepared, maximize preox, minimize hypoxia, use backup um, tools and personnel and adjuncts. Ventilator settings are highly dependent on the pre-intubation state. Get it right. Minimize drugs that'll worsen the situation. Volume resuscitate them early if it's needed. Have a vasoconstrictor handy like phenylephrine. That I don't do. I, I'm either. convinced I ought to do it after hearing Scott. Um, uh, and you know he had a really nice little instruction packet on that, but uh, I think that's reasonable. <clears throat> Watch your tidal volumes. Keep them low to start with. Keep your PEEP zero or low to start with. Titrate tidal volumes to plateau pressures of 20 to 30. If you don't have those, then watch your peak inspiratory pressures. Keep them less than 40. Prevent hypotension. If, the, if you got a paralyzed, an acid base failure, if you got a paralyzed patient, set the ventilator rate appropriately high as it's needed. Yeah, but less than 30. Less than 30. Get a blood gas um, to see where you're at. And if a patient seizes, um, get a gas and consider you can go bicarb them. For severe asthma, low, low tidal volumes, uh, respiratory rate uh, greater than 16 if they're triggering, and then sedate if they continue, then paralyze. Watch their plateau pressures. Keep them under 30 if you can. If it's greater than 30, then um, decrease your respiratory, respiratory rate by 2 to 3 per minute. And if their intrinsic PEEP is greater than 5, do that as well. If their intrinsic PEEP is less than 5, then decrease their tidal volume. Nice stuff. Nice. For severe COPD, consider an IDE ratio of one to five. Um, keep your plateaus low. They might require sedation and paralysis. Um, PEEP may be desirable because they need it to keep their airways mm -hmm. open. They've lost all their tethering, so you got to watch that effect. In ARDS, lower tidal volumes, synchrony is key. Check your plateau pressures. Increase PEEP to keep your SAT just at 90%, no higher. Don't cause barotrauma by increasing your PEEP higher than that. Good luck on your exam. Yeah, I think you'll probably, is... these slides will probably have hit it, given that we haven't seen the exam. Yeah, I think this I is think good. I think this will, will hit the vast majority, and hopefully you won't have to track back here and there to pick things up. Diane, thank you for tolerating me and you doing a lion's share of the work in preparing the slides. Rick wouldn't trust me, with neither would Asa. <laughs> but uh, they'll trust me as, uh, as someone to sort of um, bother her during the talk. So thanks for all your <laughs> Good work. Good luck on the test. Thanks for all your work.